This presentation is part of a workshop, Voicing Indigenous Food Sovereignty Struggles, which has been organized by the project Indigenous Food Systems in Transition, financed by Future Food at the Swedish University for Agricultural Sciences. Furthermore, the workshop was organized in collaboration with Case Study 18 of the Horizon 2020 Finance Project Just North. You are welcome to listen to the lecture. But for now, uh, we've been waiting for our keynote speaker, Don Morrison. She is the founder and curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. So we want our uh, keynote speaker to talk on uh, our food is our relative from production to regeneration. So without uh, further ado, I heartily welcome our keynote speaker, Don Morrison. So if you want to share your slide, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you everybody for all the work that you've put into to organizing for today and for inviting me here to to share about my work as the founder and curator of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty. And um, yeah, I'm excited to learn more about, about the work you're doing and, and maybe field some questions and, and see how that goes. So, so um, I'll just jump right into my slide and I'll start with acknowledging that I'm zooming in from the beautiful unceded lands and waters of the uh, Homasquiam, Selewatooth, and Squamish peoples, the Coast Salish peoples and uh, Coast Salish tribe, um, one of uh, 25 language groups in the Salishan language speaking um, group. It's one of uh, 11 major indigenous languages in so-called BC, the westernmost province of Canada, and uh, one of uh, 98, uh, 11, sorry, yeah, 11 major indigenous language groups in all of Canada. And there's eight of those language groups in the westernmost so uh, province of BC and Coast Salish or Salishan language group is one of them. Um, I'm a member of the Interior Salish, um, and so my home territory is in the Shikwetmukh territory, and it's about 180,000 square miles in um, the Shushwap and Adams Lake region. Um, so my people, as an Interior Salish tribe, shares common root words in our languages with the Coast Salish people, and of course, long-standing um, intertribal trade relationships and uh, kinship ties, political ties. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here today in the Coast Salish territory. And yeah, I just really think that it's important in, in you know, enjoying the, the privilege of living in the unceded lands and waters of Indigenous peoples to acknowledge that and to also acknowledge that my work on Indigenous food sovereignty, I really do strive to ensure that the people whose lands that I'm living in see the benefit in my work to their land and to their, their people. And so, um, yeah, with Indigenous food sovereignty, yeah, I think that'll be apparent more in my, in my presentation. So, um, as the founder of the Working Group on Indigenous Food Sovereignty, I've been working since 2006 for uh, March of 2006, so going on to 17 years. I've been showing up consistently to organize um, um, time and space, um, annual strategic meetings, um, gatherings of sorts and um, projects. Um, we've been mo mobilizing a lot of knowledge and networks, um, both in BC and across Canada. Our work has been recognized um, in other parts of the world as well. And um, so, yeah, I think 
Um, it's been an amazing journey for me. This photo speaks to one of our projects um, that I'll I'll explain further in to the presentation. But yeah, just mostly we focus on decolonizing food systems. So um, the photo you just saw was a, a parade, a procession that we organized in downtown Vancouver. And um, it was part of the Wild Salmon Caravan, which is a is one of the strategies that we move to mobilize uh, networks, um, um, in, engage the public through the arts and the culture um, on the topic of Indigenous people's knowledge and wild salmon conservation. So wild salmon is to us what the reindeer is to, um, to the Northern people peoples. Um, in terms of being a keystone species uh, for, so wild salmon is our most important source of protein um, in the westernmost province, um, Salish and territory and the other indigenous nations who also inhabit this part of the world. So um, in, the, uh, in our Salish and territory, we also, um, rely on elk for food, for protein. And so, um, yeah, we, we uh, this is a photo in my home territory in the Interior Salish tribe where we host um, a lot of the work we do on the two, um, with cohorts in both Interior and, and Coastal Salish territory in the Indigenous Food and Freedom School. And so this is, um, photo speaks to the elk that are coming back to our valley after being extirpated through the early um, part of colonization when elk were overhunted um, for market. And so they're coming back now and we're happy about that. Um, but we know that there's a lot of, a lot of threats um, to, to sustaining and to regenerating the populations of the elk in light of all the changes that have happened on the land um, within the colonial reality. So this picture speaks to um, kind of the fourth world. The fourth world is a term that was coined by a leader in my home territory, um, the late uh, former Grand Chief George Manuel. Um, he wrote a book called The Fourth World, an Indian Reality. And, um, he coined that term fourth world to mean um, uh, indigenous peoples who live in third world conditions in a first world country like Canada. Um, the picture of the, the roots from this invasive weed species is what we call cooch grass. I think cooch grass has made its way around the world um, and the way that colonization has also happened around the world. And um, it just speaks to, to the, the one of the sad realities that we deal with and the impacts on the land. Um, so the vision of our work is a just transition. So we think of that in terms of economic, but also ecological terms. Um, so to a regenerative tribal economy informed by subsistence paradigms, principles, and protocols. And we're in the process right now of um, doing research and advocating for the establishment of indigenous food land conservation areas. Um, we know that in Canada um, and other colonized countries around the world, that there is really no system um, to look at what food land conservation looks like to hunters, fishers, and gatherers. And I know that, that it's happening probably in some places more than others, um, but more formally within the Western science-based techno-bureaucratic framework for food, uh, land and food systems discourse, there, there really, there's a huge gap there, at least in Canada. And I'm, I'm curious to know um, how this, the different silos and sectors and agencies, uh, government agencies, research institutes, manage that kind of intersectional, um, intersectional um, work between hunting, fishing and gathering and 
um, agriculture. Um, so Vandana Shiva, a well-known, a world-renowned uh, food sovereignty activist from India talks about the monocultures of the mind and the way the Western science uh, based um, resource management system has kind of fragmented um, you know, the, the, the holistic um, kind of narrative and the complexity of indigenous biocultural heritage in the way that the agencies and the ministers operate. So um, the vision also includes climate justice um, and integrating food and energy planning. So really looking at cross-sectoral approaches and um, integrating strategies. How am I doing? I know that there's an interpreter and I wanna be mindful of, of I, I think I'm probably talking a little fast, but how, how am I doing? Okay, well, I'll just keep moving along and hope, hopefully it's, it's translating okay. So, um, so the just transition includes a paradigm shift. And so the title of my presentation um, from production to regeneration, um, I think is really key. And I think um, the Western science based uh, resource management system um, manages for production it manages for resource extraction. It works from a kind of a neoclassic economic terms of Cartesian worldview um, that the world is a machine and um, rather than a, a relative or rather than a, you know, a, um, yeah, a system that we're a part of. So for indigenous peoples, we know that food is our relative. We eat our food, it becomes us. Therefore, it's the most transformative thing we do every day. Um, the food comes from the land, so we are the land. And, and different uh, uh, spiritual leaders have talked about that. Um, Sadhguru is a, a, a teacher, a leader out of uh, India who who says that we're just big chunks of the planet walking around. <laughs> and so that's a very different shift or paradigm um, than treating food as a resource or treating land as a resource to be exploited to an external means, as opposed to a relative, an intimate relative um, that shapes and forms every aspect of our being and who we are and who, how we interact with this world. And so transitioning out of a production paradigm and a resource based kind of economic framework, um, I think is begins a lot with just our own thinking and um, that's not always easy to change. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things in the world that were, were, you know, habitually conditioned and, and even could say addicted to um, in the ways that you know, we've been entrenched into different values and ways of talking and thinking. And, and so, yeah, just really looking at, for Indigenous peoples, a transition back to land-based cultures and planning for kind of the obsolescence of the technology trap that we've been kind of, um, yeah, just um, conditioned into with the way that technology and technological solutions um, developed by Western science has become kind of controlling the world through the wealth, the, the um, you know, the huge disparity in, in the gaps of like, yeah, just the wealth and um, the social determinants of health for Indigenous peoples um, is very obvious. And, and so, yeah, what is it going to take to transition out of that? and um, to really look at decolonizing the food systems for, you know, to generate research that will support that transition um, and to curate relationships in our networks and facilitate the transformational learning that is gonna require to, to really see deep systems change 
that builds on the long-term strategies, the, the, the ancient knowledge of Indigenous peoples and the Sami peoples um, and Indigenous peoples around the world who, who are being called upon more and more to find solutions to a lot of the world's social and ecological crises that are unprecedented that have, you know, have, um, so really uh, when we think of um, how indigenous knowledge and um, can inform the, um, that transition, we, we think of, we need to look, start first of all with the methodology um, and look at transcending um, beyond and, you know, and also looking at the role of Western science, uh, but creating ethical and spaces, ethical spaces of engagement in the way that Western science and indigenous knowledge um, can support this transition. And so, so when, if we're doing that from the basis of indigenous methodologies, it looks a lot different from doing that in a kind of a static model or a Western scientific approach. So this tool is working from indigenous uh, knowledge systems and pedagogies. Um, he uses a metaphor in, in this case, it would, um, it's using a metaphor of the life cycle of wild salmon um, to understand or to, to use that as a, a way of understanding and guiding us through this process that goes um, in a circular motion, in this case from east um, to south to west to north, and then full circle back to complete the life cycle of the salmon. And in that process, um, well, before I get into the process, I want to say that the, you know, the life cycle of the reindeer um, in the north, um, this tool could be adapted, it could be contextualized within any aspect of nature or any, any metaphor um, or concept that is keystone to the worldview of, of the Sami people and of the indigenous peoples um, in whatever place uh, that may be. And so we're testing this out in terms of contextualizing it and using it in the way that I'll explain here. It's really an intra-active tool so it's process oriented. It's not definitive, or it's non-exhaustive. Um, it really is just a, a tool to give structure and terminology to the process of understanding the ways that the colonial reality interfaces with indigenous realities and narratives and models and, and just ways of thinking of the food system. So um, looking to the sun and the direction that it comes up in, it's the beginning of every day. Um, so we, we look at that as a, a guide to where we start in the circle, um, in which direction we start from. So starting from the east and um, also, you know, the beginning of the life cycle of the wild salmon is the egg stage. So, you know, the salmon spawn, they lay the eggs and the babies are born from there. And um, so at that stage, we enter into the journey of understanding more deeply the different uh, realities that are being expressed in the food system. So again, I mentioned indigenous and um, colonial realities. And so again, this could be contextualized within any other set of realities or kind of subsystems. Um, so, but here we're, we're, yeah, we're talking about the food system. So, so the points of entry in the East really just highlight um, the different uh, themes. And, and so these emerge in, in our networking and in our, our conversations. And so, one point of entry could be the model of economy. So um, indigenous, um, the oldest living memories of indigenous economies are subsistence economies, learning to live with less, giving 
cooperating, sharing, trading. Um, and then the agri-food agri system, the global kind of food system that's charted its path around the world um, is based on a capitalist model of economy. And we could even say a, techno, a technocracy. Um, so even, yeah, it seems to be, yeah, more predominantly um, expressed through um, technology more and more. Um, but there's a lot of ambiguity, you know, there's a lot of, this is where this tool is not definitive or exhaustive. It's really a tool to discuss of what those realities are in place. And that can vary widely. Um, and so, so yeah, once we understand, I, I, well, I'll give you some other examples of the different kinds of um, points of entry. So it could be model of economy as one. It could, another point of entry may be um, relationship to land. Um, it could also be um, the, um, I guess, the different cultivation strategies and practices. So with rainbow, rainbow herding, um, you know, it would be a conversation around that. Um, and then versus the, re like the reality of how that's changed through colonization and the different ways and relationships to, to the, to the um, I guess, being in relationship with, with the reindeer. Um, and so, yeah, I guess one example in my home territory, I'll relate it to the elk is that um, hunting and the way that happens either for recreation um, it's different values and a different kind of a relationship with the elk. And I, I could imagine it would be the same with the reindeer. Um, so after um, identifying all the different point of entry in which um, this conversation would be taking place, you would travel through the life cycle around the circle to the south, um, where in this case, the salmon, or the reindeer would be growing into a junior, like a teenager. At that stage, the teenager becomes a little bit more aware of other beings and, and ventures out onto its, into the world um, to learn more and gain a deeper understanding and mature in our understanding of how the different realities interface. And so they can interface in both contentious and complementary ways. And so this is the part where I think it be, starts to be, um, this is an important piece of the transformational learning. Um, so the contention um, are really important opportunities for transformation and for understanding contradictions, uh, conflicts um, of values for understanding um, yeah, just some of the wicked systemic problems. And that term wicked systemic problems is a term that's came out of a, a framework for social innovation at the um, University of Waterloo in Ontario. Um, so you could probably Google that and find more information about it if you're not already aware of it. Um, so we don't run from the contention. We know that that's where a lot of innovation happens. And, and we see all the points of interface as complementary because they, they, even the contention is an opportunity for innovation. Um, but the complementarity is, you know, the, the points of interface that we know um, there's very little contention. And those are things we can act on uh, right away. And those are actions that emerge in this relationship and why we call it intraactive. And then from, from once we've identified the, identified the point of contention or complementarity, in this case, I think we could say productionism um, is contentious in the way that it is very linear, often very linear mathematical models, and it intensifies um, the, the um, impact on the land often um, because it's concentrated on 
perhaps a scale on the landscape that may be problematic or it intensifies and um, um, I guess just um, it places the biodiversity at risk when you're intensifying on smaller scales of land versus extending out into for reindeer, it would be the entire migration corridor. Um, so what productionism looks like um, versus regeneration is managing for production is different um, than managing for energy in terms of regenerating the populations and the transformation of energy, which indigenous cultures, I would, I would think that the Sami um, have traditional knowledge around, you know, managing for the energy and the life cycle of the, the, the Sami. So it's a different way of, I guess, framing how um, managing that relationship with the reindeer, or in this case, the salmon. So um, once we identify the contradictions um, and the contention, that leads us to, in my culture, it's the coyote is the trickster or the transformer. And the transformer in my culture and indig indigenous cultures um, around the world um, do have teachings and stories and um, oral history around, you know, the stories are not just legends. They actually, they actually give clues um, to the way the understanding um, that Indigenous peoples have had about the way that matter and energy interact and um, the way that transformation happens. So in my culture, it's the coyote who teaches that. And he often teaches it through contradictions and through his own bad behavior. And so, so from those contradictions, we can identify wicked problems that really there may not be any answers for it. Um, it they might be too big of problems, um, but we ask the questions anyways, because it simply leads us to understanding either our gaps of knowledge um, or unseen potential that lies dormant in those gaps of knowledge. And we identify there's a lot of paradox in life and great mystery and things that we accept that we may never know and maybe we ethically don't want to know. Um, but so this is where this, this is a very different process from Western science that seeks to control that or seeks to have an outcome of that. And so that's why the circular process brings us back to just identifying those gaps of knowledge and any potential strategies um, that we might begin again into another conversation in the East and enter into another conversation um, that maybe would be a whole research project. So each key point in this process could be a PhD thesis for its own intents and purposes. Um, but it's kind of like creating a matrix of key points to think to lead us into transformative and this just transition. Um, so this slide just uh, is a picture of my homeland and um, where we are uh, researching and advocating for the establishment of Indigenous food land conservation areas. And this is a cohort we're working with in the Indigenous Food and Freedom School. And um, so we just, I just wanted to say that Indigenous food land conservation areas are informed by Indigenous law and the original instructions that we've been given as Indigenous people to be in relationship, to, to uphold our sacred responsibility um, of protecting, conserving and restoring and mobilizing knowledge, teaching our children and the next generations, and then creating ethical spaces of engagement. So, um, working with, with our non-Indigenous friends and allies in a good way to, to do, do the work we need to do. Um, and this photo speaks to the rematriation and that we're charting a path to regenerating 
and restoring indigenous food lands. And we're centering grandmother's law um, and looking at the teachings of grandmother um, as a way to address the injustices in, that are kind of been normalized in the heteropatriarchy um, that asserts, um, you know, that controls the, the, the 1% who enjoy the highest level of comfort in this world, um, you know, predominantly white males who who make decisions and who control the land and food system in, in the way the system favors and enables that. So we really feel that bringing the grandmothers in and to the, you know, centering um, what in my nation we call the grandmother's law and the teachings of caring and sharing for the families and, and for the reindeer and for the animals, the land. And of course, we know there's interwoven roles of all genders and generations, um, but I think just to bring balance to that, um, some equity uh, is really important for us. And this just speaks to the fact that we know that a lot of the conflict comes in within, you know, um, I guess just being assimilated into a productionist kind of paradigm or business model. Um, there's always the rationale is often, well, we need the jobs, we need the employment. And of course, we know that's true. Um, we there is extreme poverty in indigenous uh, communities. Um, there is a need to 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 address those social determinants of health um, that stem from that poverty. Um, and we need to remember that the land and food is our first and our primary job. And it is what enables us to express our ind indigeneity. And so, um, yeah, that's the end of my show. And I hope I didn't go over time too badly. <laughs>